From beyond the outskirts of the digital frontier, it's the IGN DigiGods. Now please welcome two men who are really messing with my zen thing, man. Wade Major and Mark Kaiser. Oh, messing with the zen thing. To whom do we owe that outstanding intro, Corey? Lance Taylor brings us that little treat. Sweet. Thank you, Lance. Um, all right. So uh, we did our Halloween show last week and uh, had the giveaways. And uh, so this is our last show now for uh, a couple of weeks. It is? We're not, we're not going to be here next week. We're not. I'm not going to be here next week. Because I, I, got, I got NPR and we got screeners for LAFCA. And, and then there's like AFM and AFI Fest. And, it's, it's too mu- and I got a baby. And it's too much. Don't call your wife a baby. Gotta, your gotta, wife's an adult. Got to got to take a week off to, to get organized, and then I'm trying to sort out all the stuff for the for the holiday show. And there's like we we, we got books and we got hardware and we got all kinds of stuff for the holiday show and and and, and, and special guests and there's all kinds of stuff going on tonight. So we're not doing a show next week. Are we doing a show the week mm-hmm. after that? Yes. Okay. Yes, we will Making be doing sure. a show after that. Very so uh, so Mark, uh, let's just get yes, ma'am. let's just get right into this. Uh, let's just do some TV. Let's just blow blow through some TV, man. I like it. Let's just blow through some TV. Uh, the Red Skelton Show, the early years. Oh, that's a winner to start Fantastic. with, Wade. That is a winner. Fantastic. My mother hated Red Skelton, and she could never understand why. When I was a kid, I just I I it was I was it was uncontrollable. I would laugh and I would laugh and I would laugh, and she just thought he was so stupid. Um, this is fantastic. This is from Timeless Media, who's been doing a lot of Western stuff lately. A lot of vintage TV, good stuff. Uh, Big Valley and other things. Really love the people with Timeless. They, they, they find great stuff. And this is a nice, big, heavy Hefton uh, box set, The Red Skelton Show, the early years, 1951 to 1955. And, you know, Red Skelton made some movies, but he really kind of, uh, he's like, like Lucille Ball. He's more a phenomenon of television. There were a lot of these people who, oh, who had decent careers in the movies, uh, but it was on television that they really took off. And uh, Skelton's one of them. He just, in the early 50s, when television was this new thing, he was just became this dominant figure. People loved him. And this is 90 episodes. Oh, my um, God. And, and, and they don't get old. And you see all the crazy characters he does. I mean, Clem Kadiddlehopper is the one that always just killed me when I was a kid. I just couldn't get enough of it. Others here I'd forgotten about, like uh, Freddy the Freeloader. I know a lot of people who, who, who fit that profile today. Uh, Willie Lump Lump, Cauliflower Mapug. Uh, Don't read all the characters. Nobody knows one from the other. All right. Anyway, a lot of great guest stars here. Uh, it's 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 fantastic, and some wonderful stuff on the bonus disc. Uh, a profile of uh, of you know Red Skelton as a person, not just you know as this television personality, but as a person. And what a great guy he was. And uh, a dress rehearsal and a special bonus episode. So really a wonderful set. The Red Skelton Show, the early years, 1951 and 1955, from Timeless Media. It does, just doesn't get better than that. And then uh, on the other end of the spectrum, the complete second season of The Soul Man with Cedric the Entertainer. Oh, my gosh. This is on TV land. I, you know, Cedric, man, I, dude, you're funny. You're really, really funny. And it looks like the character that he plays in the upcoming Chris Rock film is pretty funny. I can't, you know, I I saw the trailer for that film. It came out a couple of weeks ago. It could be good. It, it looks really good. It. it looks really good. I know. It looks really good. It's and, he's had an interesting directing career. And Paramount paid a bundle for that. I know they did. I mean, that's a negative pickup. When, when was the last time a studio went to a festival or a market and paid out the nose for a, for, for a pickup? For Especially a comedy that's probably not going to travel overseas. I mean, that's, that, that's impressive. I, I wouldn't have expected Paramount to do that. Anyway... That being said, Cedric the Entertainer, I don't know, man. This is, this is the second season of a, of a show that airs on TV land, and I just don't think it's very funny. Um, it, just, it feels like he's just kind of going through the motions and doing his shtick and doing his persona, which used to work for stand-up comics on TV. But I don't know. I, we've seen Cedric so much, and especially making, you know, in movies and in some of those, like, what were those Bud Light commercials that he did for a while? Sure. It just, it just doesn't. It's just not his forte, I don't think. So, anyway, uh, second season of The Soul Man, uh, you know, if, uh, strictly for fans, let's say. 
Uh, Wade, uh, one of uh, my favorite shows growing up was In Search Of, hosted by Leonard Nimoy. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And uh, before In Search Of, uh, we had In Search of Ancient Mysteries. This was the uh, this was the documentary, the TV documentary that kind of uh, led, actually led to the creation of and the launching of and the greenlining of the In Search Of series. In Search of Mystery, In Search of Ancient Mysteries was hosted by the great Rod Serling, and this one is uh, the original, the proto, and it's all about how. You know the uh, the adva- the civilizations that built the pyramids and built some of these very sophisticated stone structures might have been more advanced than we think, uh, and what that means. Were they influenced by aliens? Were they just really smart? And uh, Rod Sterling delves into that. I mean, some it, it's an interesting it's an interesting doc, well worth renting. The, the The issue is that this thing was done, you know. 40 years ago. So right. a lot of the information is right. you know, has been superseded by newer information. But in terms of TV history, In Search of Ancient Mysteries is a good show uh, hosted by a TV legend and it led to the um, uh, Leonard Nimoy one. Lovely. Is that right? Did not know that. Did, I did, did not know that. Not that know is that. wild and wacky In stuff. Of ancient Mysteries. Gotta love Rod Serling. Oh, heavyweight. Total heavyweight. Leonard Nimoy, if you were going to bring back Twilight Zone, you need a host. I mean, I know he's like 107 years old. By the way, you know who's 90, 91 years old? Abe Vigoda. Larry Storch. God. Larry Storch is still with us. Isn't that awesome? Ken Berry's 80. Oh, Ken Berry. If Forrest Berry. Whitaker were still alive, I'd recommend that we have a reunion. Because uh, what's-her-face, the girl on the show, she was 16. Wait, was Forrest Whitaker was still alive? No, Forrest... Um... Forrest Tucker. Sorry. Forrest Tucker. Forrest Whitaker. What am for, I saying? For Forrest <laughs> Whitaker. Can you imagine like a reunion of F Troop, and we invite Forrest Whitaker, and he shows up because he's replacing Forrest Tucker. And what the hell? I'll go through the motions. My name's Forrest. Run, Forrest, run. Okay. Very that good was Robin. like a triple, very good Robin. That was a weird triple meta thing I just did. Good job. Okay. All right. Uh, Madman, the final season, part one. Oh, you're not doing this Harry Potter. Twilight uh, thing that they do now with the last film out of a trilogy. You split it into two so it's no longer a trilogy or whatever. Stop that. Uh, Mad Men. Just give us the final season, man. Stop it. The final season, part one. Um, anyway, the, 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 well, the, the reason for this basically being that the final season is like now split by AMC. So it's kind of not like a final season. It's like a final two half seasons. So the final episodes, of course, are not airing until the spring, so they're, they're really baiting us here. Um, this show's kind of a little bit run out of gas, but it's, it's still good. It's still a good cast, but you can, tell, you can tell just watching this that everybody on this show kind of wants to move on. You know, and, and I, you get, it's it's running on fumes, and you get that every once in a while with a show. When when it really, it's everyone knows it's like nearing the end. It's the last season. Everybody's kind of doing like, okay, we get it. It's you know, it, we we don't have to get renewed. We don't have to give it our best. It, it, this is it. You know, we, the, the series could this can suck. I'm still going to get my residuals. So you kind of feel like everybody's just a little bit going through the motions. They oh, don't. I've done that. I, yeah. I, the, I, I, I remember the last episode of the Roseanne talk show. Yeah. I remember I sat in the, in the control room. Last episode, I read the paper. <laughs> I did. See, See it's, it's a, you can tell. You just get that feeling. Uh, Rick and Morty, season one from Adult Swim. Everybody who listens to the show, they know how we feel about Adult Swim. It's just like, let's think no, of something. No, come on. I'm about to talk about uh, I know, uh, Robot but Chicken DC sure, villains. But, the, but most of the time with Adult Swim, doesn't it feel like a bunch of guys sat in a room, got stoned, and said, well, this is something no, weird. No, you always What's say the that. the weirdest talk, thing? No, you always say that when we talk. Uh, so, but Adult Swim, whereas I am more permissive. Okay, I think well, they're funny. Rick and Morty, I, I will backtrack on that a little bit. It, 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 it really does feel like, what the hell were they thinking? But you know what? It, it's... I. I it is as kind of silly as it is, and as much as this really does feel like they're kind of it, there's an they kind of this kind of an '80s throwback mentality to it, something that feels a little back to the futurey and a little bit even you know wait till your father gets home and so I, I don't know of all of these kind of funky animated shows on uh, on Adult Swim, I, th- th- this may be promising, so I'll give it a little bit more time. I I certainly feel like. Uh, you know, it, it's got it's got something to work with. So uh, even though I'm I'm not entirely forgiving, it's got something. So let's see what the second season brings. And then uh, also animated, this is from uh, Cartoon Network, is uh, Courage the Cowardly Dog, season two, 13 episodes. And uh, Courage the Cowardly Dog uh, shows amazing uh, courage, I guess, in being cowardly. Um, 
Did that make any sense at all? It did in my world. Yeah, all right. Well, there's a whole John Crick Falusi vibe here, uh, which is cool. I'm totally into it. But, you know, Crick Falusi really doesn't get enough uh, credit for being the incredibly... Um, he's very inventive. He's so inv- funny. I, I, he, needs, he needs to do something else. He's now. one of the most influential animators of the past 30 years. Yes. I would say. And people don't give him enough credit for that. But there's, there's stuff that he did that is, is completely unique and it filters into everything and it filters uh, all through this even though this was created by John Dilworth. Uh, but, you know, whatever. It's, it's, it's 13 crazy episodes about a dog and, and his owners and uh, all of the weird crap that happens. And, you know, there you go. It's, it's funny. It's weird. It's, it's off the wall. And uh, it seems a little bit unusual for Cartoon Network. But, uh, sure, knock yourselves out. If you've seen it, you know what you're in for. If you haven't seen it, uh, scour the Internet a little bit and see if it, if it will scare the children. Good job. Go. Go. Uh, Robot Chicken, uh, DC Comics Special 2, Villains in Paradise. Uh, Robot Chicken, of course, is the uh, brainchild of Seth Green. And uh, I, like this, uh, I like this show. I think it's funny. It's, it's just, nothing but just blackout gags based uh, on you know pop culture, a lot of Star Wars, a lot of comic books, and it's all dolls and stop motion uh, animation. I think it's funny. I think there are probably funnier uh, DVD collections than this particular one, but I do like the fact that it's DC Villains, and uh, I like it. DC Comics Special 2, Villains in Paradise. Wade, what are you doing? I'm, I'm you're making putting, room. You're putting that there? Yeah. Uh, a couple TV things for you. We got uh, Two Broke Girls, which is uh, now its complete third season on uh, DVD. I hate the fact these aren't on Blu-ray. Um, I never got into the show, although I guess Kat Dennings, who looked like she was going to have like an indie film career, instead she now has a syndicated show that is like a big hit, and now she's incredibly rich. And I really wish that maybe she would go back on hiatuses and maybe do some indie films because she's very funny on the big screen. I like Kat Denning. Yeah, I like her too. She's, she's not. I mean, she doesn't have great range, but she has a, a kind of a, a quirky, goofy she's on-screen quirky charm. Thing, yes. She's got that charm, you know. Well, she was the one who, like in, in, in Thor, in one of the Thor movies, she yeah, was like the right. wacky best friend, that's whatever. It. So she she could do a lot of that stuff. Um, anyway, so this is the uh, third season of Two Broke Girls, now available on uh, uh, VDV. See how I swapped that I, out? I did. That was very clever. <laughs> Good for you. 11th season of Two and a Half Men. This show has long uh, lived its usefulness, unless you're weighed. If you're weighed and you love this show more than anything in the world. This is another uh, season with Aston Kutcher. And uh, I'm sorry, I don't get it. I think Chuck Lorre shows are not funny. They're totally hack. I don't get it. Big, big bank theory. Don't get it. Lame. Uh, by the way, yeah. I have to say this. I'm just a quick Go for it. digression. Yeah. Okay. The other night. Yes. Now, I have not seen Saturday Night Live in a long time. Uh, yeah, I, I watched I, it, and okay. The only a, the only thing a, I watched it's in a rut, man. The only thing I watched, yeah, I didn't watch the whole thing. Yeah, um, was Weekend Update. Oh my god, with Michael Shea so and sorry. some other guy. I'm so sorry. Are you kidding me? I know. Are you kidding me? I know. I know. Right? It's, it's not even like oh that wasn't funny. It's like they're just words. They're just saying words. I, I don't know what. And they're then people thinking. laugh at the end of the word. They have, they have taken two writers, two guys, two guys from the writers' room. Now there is no actual cast member doing doing news update. They've taken two guys from the writers' room. And they put them on Weekend Update, and it's dreadful. But they, it, but the, but the jokes are lame. The jokes are terrible. They're, they're not awful. even jokes. They're like I'm looking at it going. I mean, I mean, I when just... when Seth Meyers when Seth Meyers was doing that. Well, in fact, in fact, when when you know, I mean, it just I don't know. It, it Seth was doing a great job. Amy Poehler did a great job. I mean, they all did a really good job right up to Seth Meyers leaving. When Seth left. Cicely did okay, but man, now it's just those two guys are not funny. It's just weak it's sauce, terrible. man. It's just really weak it sauce. It is super weak sauce. That's what I it, don't, I, I, it, was, it was. You know what it was? It was it's and, terrible, uh, 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 honestly. And you oh. know, uh, it was shocking, shocking how funny it wasn't. Did, did shocking. You, you, did you did you see when when uh, they did the the, the Stefan the, the the latest Stefan? Thing I heard about it. Bill Hader showed up. Bill Hader's Stefan was great, but you could tell. That having them just kind of go through the motions, as opposed to having having Seth do the kind of you know that that little homoerotic thing that they, they they had that little homoerotic chemistry, that was great. And not having Seth Meyers there, it messed Bill Hader up. It like messed him up. It was like it was like he was sitting there reading with some schmo who was not really an actor. That that like that chemistry, Terrible. that give and take. It was it was dreadful. Anyway, anyway. Two, two, <laughs> oh that. my gosh! Two and a half men, eleventh season. Uh, Chuck Lorre show hated. Um, <laughs> complete second season of the following. Um, uh, you know this um, this was kind of a phenomenon in the first season, and um, now it's back for the second season. It didn't really take off as much as the first season. 
but again, Fox pushes the envelope pretty well on these uh, one-hour dramas that they do. James Purfoy back, obviously Kevin Bacon back. And, uh, you know, I, I think it's uh, – the, the first season was more culty. This season, not as uh, great. But again, Kevin Williamson, smart guy, smart showrunner, did a lot of different shows, a lot of different genres. He's a smart guy. He gets it. It um, would be nice if this show uh, picked up um, next season, maybe switch it up a little bit. But uh, anyway, second season of the following, now it's the first. All right. And then lastly on the TV front, before we get to a few documentaries, and then some amazing, we got new movies this week, some uh, titles from you know last week and this week, because we covered Halloween last week. Great stuff. Some really good stuff. Uh, what's not great is Duck Dynasty seasons four through six in an eight disc collection. What is four, four, four through six? Well, uh, they have one through three in a box set. They're doing four through six in a box set. I don't right. know why. But this one comes with a limited edition full-sized beard, which you can see a little bit of in the way that the thing is packaged. Mark, feel the beard. Feel the beard. It's perfect for Halloween, it's which was last week. It's not a beard. What is it? It's, it's like it's like it's it's like uh, yeah. it's like hair from it's like synthetic thing. It's like hair from a from a actually, dead that's coyote. His, actually, you know what? Here's what he did. That's his actual hair. He actually spent two years in anticipation of this DVD <laughs> so release, growing hair, for, snipping it off, yeah. you know, putting yeah. it in some sort of protective covering that's or, exactly or something, Tupperware, and then he saved it so there was enough for X tens of thousands of also, copies of this DVD set. This also includes the exclusive Duck Dynasty video game. Is 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 it where Phil shoots gays? I <laughs> is that the video game? He takes gay. He, he shoots, shoots gay ducks. He shoots gay ducks. He shoots gay ducks. That's very exciting. Anyway, uh, look. I mean, the show is what it is. You either like it or you don't. I I don't. I never really got into. I, I don't get it. But uh, this beard thing is just creepy and weird. Uh, you know, anyone who's going to buy this because they want to have one of these beards to wear around. Is, are you kidding me? Come on, stop. All right. Um, some documentaries. We'll uh, go through these as quickly as possible. Got a couple of really interesting docs from uh, First Run Features, who always sends their stuff out in these really cool little slimline eco packages. Uh, the first one is Every Three Seconds. And uh, this is from uh, Daniel Carslake, who did uh, the previous documentary, which was very good for The Bible Tells Me So. Every Three Seconds, you're thinking, what happens every three seconds? Tell me, tell me. Uh, it, basically, every three seconds, the... Um, Let's put it this way. It's not about, like, every three seconds someone dies of a heart attack or, or someone dies in a, in a, in a car crash or, uh, or takes drugs or, you know, all, all these statistics usually, like, there, there's a rape every three seconds or there's a murder every three seconds. It's not, it's not that. It's, a, it's completely the opposite of that. This is all about uh, doing good in the world and, and how you change the world one small little tiny step at a time. And it's five people, uh, five totally different people who, whose experiences and lives are uh, detailed in this because they made uh, a, a choice. They just decided to go out and and do something. And it's a it's a wonderful little documentary. It just it, it'll it'll completely inspire you. And then uh, we also have Uranium Drive In, uh, Half Life of the American Dream. This is uh, all the goodness that you feel from the other one will go right out the window with this when you realize that there's this one little town, uh, this mining community that um, it, it, it made a decision. Rather, it turns out an unwise decision uh, to go back to uranium mining, and uh, it's it's a it's a it kind of presents the whole thing as a dilemma, a rather chilling dilemma at that. And then uh, last couple from uh, first run features that um, are a little bit more, I, I guess uh, you know, strictly if you're if this is in your 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 wheelhouse. Uh, Hill and Warshaw made a documentary called Wagner's Jews and uh, as you may know the great composer Wagner author of so many great operas was a notorious anti-Semite and um, this gets into all of those issues and details it. and if you're not into Wagner and if you know you just kind of figure good riddance you're dead and buried and all of those crazy Viking operas I, I could take them or leave them it's not going to really be all that interesting to you uh, but this is, gets very much into the relationships that he had with certain Jewish figures and the times and the, the, the politics of the era and, uh, and obviously how it impacted his art and how it impacts a lot of artists today uh, including when you know you have people like Zubin Mehta and others who uh, have gone and performed, and you know I think uh, uh, Leonard Bernstein was the first who did, who went and performed Wagner in Israel, which was hugely controversial at the time. So anyway, that's that's a, a very dense and interesting doc, but not for everybody. 
And then the people uncounted the untold story of the Roma, which is all about the gypsies. I, I'm, I, you call me a bigot if you want. I have a real chip on my shoulder about gypsies. Bigot. And I, you, you damn right. And uh, you know you can ro- romanticize them all that you want. This goes through uh, a dozen different countries and talks to all kinds of experts and people, and it really tries to humanize them and sort of show them, especially you know when Hitler targeted them as well. It tries to show them as like you know humanize them as a people. I that's fine and well, but I have been in touch with gypsies. I've had experiences with gypsies in Europe, and they've stolen stuff from me. And they've stolen stuff. And, and you know what? You don't walk away from that experience going, oh, those wonderful gypsies, they're so misunderstood. You walk away from that experience going, the stereotypes are all right. They're just a bunch of thieves. They're just a bunch of like nomadic thieves, and they just roam around the world just screwing people over. So uh, that being said, if you want to watch this and say, oh, those wonderful people, but I'm not going to, uh, no, I, I, I'm sticking with my stereotypes. Wade. Yes. Tell you something. Yes. <laughs> yesterday we mentioned. Uh, yesterday we mentioned how great uh, Love is Strange is about uh, a I'm gay relationship. Feeling kind of loopy. This week we have a documentary <laughs> on uh, Star Trek actor turned uh, gay activist George Takei. It's called To Be Takei, and uh, To Be Takei is just mm. terrific. It is a. It is good. You know what? It's uh, I, there's something a little bit cheesy about you, about Takei. Um, there was something cheesy about him on the show, but he's just so. He, you know what? But shouldn't honestly, he's all, been through a shouldn't lot. Shouldn't we all have known? Just in the what was it? it? Naked Time was like the second episode of Star Trek. Yeah, the one where he's shirtless with that. With he's the, shirtless and he's out there with the rapier doing his doing his little fencing thing. Shouldn't we have known in that moment? Shouldn't it have been obvious to everybody I, at, at that age when I was I when guess, I was, when I was uh, discovering that show? No, yeah, I would no. not know that. Yeah, I guess not. Anyway, uh, To Be TK is great. It's a story of a guy who's had an amazing career. He's been very resilient in both ends of his life. When he was a kid, he was in, a, a, he was in an internment camp yep. here. And then later in life, he became a gay activist. So uh, he's had an amazing it, it, career it, and amazing life. He, he, you, it's very easy to make light of him because he is a Star Trek figure. And then he's become a gay icon. And it's very easy to let him be defined by those two things. Because he's kind of been, he's gone from one typecast thing to another. A little bit like everybody on Star Trek, you know? And uh, we sort of cartoonize them all. And that's what's great about this, is that it really does kind of take him away from all of that. And it tells you things you never knew about him. And I think it's great. It's really good. Yep. Very highly recommended to be yep. decay. Yeah. Uh, the Steve Rude story, Rude Dude. This is a documentary by Ian Fisher. and uh, Ian Fleming? Yeah. And, uh, you know, Steve Rude basically is, uh, is a comic book artist, and uh, this is uh, his, uh, all about his attempt to kind of validate himself as a fine artist and uh, what he goes through. It's, uh, I, I don't know that I think a great deal of him as an artist or as a fine artist, but as a portrait of the artistic process and all of the doubts and struggles that you have as, as, uh, as a person and, you know, what you go through and, you know, he, like he's bipolar and he's got all these other issues. Um, it creates a very colorful portrait of, a, of an artist and you realize that there's a lot that, you know, art is not just what a person produces, but it is who you are and that's, that's worth all, uh, everything in the world. So uh, it is a, that's an interesting doc. Uh, the Steve Rude story, Rude Dude. Uh, Jay, uh, Jay, what, what's your name? Is, is your name Jay? Frank. <laughs> Jimmy, Jeff, John, Jeff, George. Yeah. Uh, Whitey, United States of America versus J, uh, James J. Bulger is a fascinating uh, documentary about um, James Bulger. Now, he's being played in an upcoming film by um, Johnny Depp. So that's interesting. This guy, uh, Bulger, was just an infamous gangster, a modern day gangster this guy and you know the documentary gets into his life and his career and when he got arrested and up through the courtroom and what happened and all the corruption and not only corruption his own corruption but corruption within the nation's you know law enforcement and legal systems so I think Whitey is just absolutely terrific you know this guy kind of came out of nowhere it was really more of like a New York Post kind of a story you know, very kind of, uh, it's a very New York y kind of story, very New York Post y kind of story. But man, when you really check out who this guy was, he's absolutely fascinating for the wrong reasons, of course. He's absolutely fascinating, but uh, what the director does here, Joe Berlinger, is again, he gets into what the fact that there was corruption on both sides, and you get this big cast of lawyers and reporters and cops and ex cops and, uh, and, 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 and wise guys and whatnot. And uh, everything they do and say, and it's just really interesting stuff. I, I, I have a feeling that the, I can't imagine the Johnny Depp version of the story will be any more interesting than, than Whitey, 
uh, United States of America versus James J. Bulger. It's a really good documentary. It's on Blu-ray. Um, it's one of the better crime documentaries of recent years, and I would definitely uh, check it out. You know, when, um, when Whitey was arrested, the building that he'd been living in for 20 years or 30 years, whatever it was, uh, a friend of mine lives in the same building still, screenwriter, and uh, used to see him on the elevator every day. <laughs> like, every day. Had no idea it was Whitey Bulger. Wow. I know, isn't that funny? Crazy. We've got uh, How We Got to Now with Stephen Johnson, uh, The History and Power of Great Ideas. This is long. This is a PBS thing. It, this is, I mean, two discs. This thing goes on for like six hours. And it's, uh, it's remarkable uh, because it's about six different ideas. And you go, what? When you first, when you first read about this, you're like, I'm, it, so clean. These are the ideas. Clean, time, glass, light, cold, Sound. You're like, those aren't ideas, those are just concepts. But that's, what this is about is how our approach to each of those ideas, technologically and philosophically and culturally and socially, has completely changed the world. I mean, for example, uh, clean is about, you know, being able to clean water and what it does once you're able to, I mean, we take it for granted, water's clean. I gotta turn on the faucet and I gotta get a glass of water, like right here. You used to give me some water. You don't have sewage water in your pipes, do you? No? I, no? Okay. This is a real gonna, building, Wade. Uh, well, I'm going to take mind. a sip. I'm going to take a sip. Here we go. Oh, mm, mm, now, Wade, mm. get this. I take this for granted. But it's changed the world. You like that? That was a, that was a, that was a visual aid on, a, on an audio yeah, show. You're fine. On a podcast. So get this. Last yeah. night, I saw Phil Klein, our friend Phil Klein, right? <laughs> so I'm talking to Phil Klein, who, by the way, has no hair. And Phil says to me, is, I'm not making this up. Phil listens to this podcast, so you better be no, nice. he doesn't. He's got bad things to do. Okay. So Phil says to me, I'm not making this up. He says, I, I've been watching the best documentary on PBS. And he, he didn't remember yeah. the name of it, but he remembered that he remembered clean. Yeah. And he also mentioned time. Yeah. How, how it came to be how over it, the centuries that we it. figured out what a second, a minute. I mean, it wasn't obvious. No. Not only was it in a second, a minute, an hour was, but how the world coordinated its time throughout all the different time That's zones. That's this. It how, didn't happen how we got overnight. To now. Yeah, we got to know. And, and, and by the way, you know, it's funny because people used to wear um, um, uh, sundials on their wrists. You know this, right? Yeah, of course. They used to wear sundials on their wrists and they used to dr- drive like cars that they would break with, run with their feet and break with their feet. Right. And, and, and then they go to the drive in, they get a big brontosaurus exactly. rib and they put it on the side of the car right. and the car would tip over. Absolutely. Things have changed. Wow. All these concepts have changed the world. It's unbelievable. Uh, no, like light is really super interesting because. Light has changed everything. I mean, it obvious. We, we take this for granted. It's like, I wonder what nightlife was like, you know, in Alexandria. And, no, there was no nightlife. There were no lights. It got dark. Everyone went to bed. It, 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 there was. There's no nightlife. There's maybe a guy with a torch no. somewhere you know what? guarding a cave. That's it. They and partied like it's 1999 BC. When you get to when you get to the kerosene lamp, and when you get to you know all these European cities, and you know suddenly you're able to really have some kind of an experience at night in Paris and Vienna, and it's, that changes everything. It, it, and then the, le- the electric light bulb, obviously, is like. Phew, Oh, wait, no one cares. How, how, how much we have to talk about? Uh, okay. uh, a fair amount. Okay, so thank you. anyway, and then uh, really, the, let me let me do uh, these three really quickly before I let you let you get to that. Um, uh, three different countries and three different concepts here. Uh, one is America. Imagine the world without her. This is the uh, Dinesh D'Souza, uh, the latest Dinesh D'Souza documentary to uh, attack uh, you know the Obama and. Uh, Kind of, it's a highly intensely political, following on his previous doc, uh, which was the one where uh, Obama, 20, was the Obama 2016, ever, yeah, exactly. which was you know the, the winds world. up becoming the second most successful documentary of all time underneath Fahrenheit 9/11. Uh, all of these things are polemics. You, if you know Dinesh D'Souza, you, you know exactly what you're going to get. There's you know. The thing with Michael Moore is that is that at least Michael Moore movies are entertaining. They're funny. Well, he's fat and he's schlubby. He's fat and he's schlubby. He's funny. D- Dinesh is just like it's it, preaching the choir. It's I mean, the, it's it, and, and so is so is Michael Moore. Well, so course. I mean, if you're, you know, if you if you if you think Obama's the devil and Dinesh D'Souza is the greatest thing since sliced bread, this is for you. If if you disagree, then don't get anywhere near it. Um, nuclear nation surviving Fukushima is uh, really quite uh, provocative. It, uh, it it means to make the case that uh, based in Fukushima, nuclear power is just too dangerous for us. Uh, we just shouldn't be messing with it. My feeling is, well, I, I'm okay with nuclear energy as long as we don't put nuclear power plants on islands that sit on gigantic fault lines where entire you know uh, tectonic plates connect. Maybe that's a problem. Uh, I realize Japan needs power, but 
you know, you, 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 really what I took away from this is this is not the country or the place to be putting nuclear power plants. And we're going to be paying for this for a very long time. That being said, it's very provocative. It will certainly get you thinking, and uh, that's what it's meant to do. And the last of the unjust by Claude Lanzmann is uh, pretty outstanding, although here's the thing. Claude Lanzmann, as we all know, is the documentarian who made Shoah, which is the greatest documentary that will ever exist on the Holocaust and ever will exist. And uh, he basically decides to go back and fish out a lot of his old footage and, um, you know, three decades later, he kind of reconceptualizes a lot of that stuff into a new documentary, and that is The Last of the Unjust. And um, it is, I, I don't want to call it kind of a sequel to Shoah. Um, I talked about this on PBS at the time, and this is, it's impossible to sort of summarize this film. It's just, it's like Shoah. It's long. It's not that long, but it's long and it's all-encompassing. It's like four hours and it's, you know, it's a gorgeous Blu-ray. It's a very important film. But if you haven't seen Shoah, I'm not sure that, that this, you're gonna, this is almost like... You, you, it's not a sequel, but you almost have to see Shoah first. Oh, I agree. But, so, but don't forget, Shoah is a very intense sit. It's, it's, it's it, hours and hours long, and it's incredible. But it is, but you, you really... It, it's not a good time at the movies. No. But it's, it's, it's a masterpiece. It is. Uh, Billy Crystal's 700 Sundays. This is an HBO special co-starring Billy Crystal. I saw Billy Crystal live when... Um, I saw him uh, speak along with uh, Mel Brooks' Carl Reiner um, when Sid Caesar died. They had a special thing at the Paley Center. Billy Crystal was there. And uh, 700 Sundays is, a, is a pretty much a story of his life. And he's great because he's obviously a great performer. He's been in many films, stand-up comedy, hosted the Oscars. So nobody does uh, stage work quite as uh, funnily. I'm going to say funnily. As uh, Billy Crystal. So, if you are a Billy Crystal fan and couldn't get out to see the show, I would definitely recommend Seven Hundred Sundays. It's a very, it's very funny. It's very heartwarming. Goes through his life from an early age up until uh, you know, up until his uh, uh, later life doing movies and whatnot. So, it's uh, good stuff. It's good stuff. Crystal has won uh, six Emmys in his life, and uh, this thing is truly a testament to his uh, professional and personal success. So I would check it out if you're a fan. All right. New movies. I'm going to start with a couple of stuff, with a couple of things that uh, we really just, uh, they, they don't warrant that much attention. One is The Prince with Jason Patrick, John Cusack, and Bruce Willis. So here's, me. here's the story of this movie. Uh, Jason Patrick, John Cusack, and Bruce Willis get together and they go, remember when we used to actually, actually be stars? We're kind of hosed. So let's just, uh, let's just uh, make some low-budget movie or some mid-budget movie just for the hell of it. How about just something that's a little bit like Taken? Okay, so Jason Patrick, uh, his, he thinks his daughter... I know, Jason Patrick. He, he yeah. thinks it could have been, right? What could have been? He had a moment. Ugh. Couldn't extend that moment. Thinks his daughter's been kidnapped, uh, hooks up with uh, John Cusack, and uh, Bruce Willis is the baddie, and, uh, you know, kind of an action thing that doesn't really work, but it, whatever. You know, the, 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 those guys have a following, and if those three actors make you just get weak in the knees, you'll, you'll be fine with it. Uh, Beethoven's Treasure Tale is horrible. Why do they keep making these? How many Beethoven movies have there been? This has got to be like the 27th dog. They've all died by now. It's just this, like these sloppy St. Bernards are supposed to make us laugh. Oh, look. Look, even... It's for kids. But it's not for kids. I wouldn't show this to my daughter if she begged me. There's no way. There's no conceivable way. This is horrible. Um, it's just... Oh, it's just dirt dumb. And the thing that's really upsetting is that Jonathan Silverman... Jonathan Silverman, why are you the guy in the Beethoven movies now? Why? He was in Beethoven's Big Break, and now he's doing... It's like, don't! Stop it! Jim Belushi already gave up on these things. Stop it! Just get a job. Do something else, please. Christy Swanson, you were Buffy. You were the original Buffy yeah, in the movie she, Buffy. Yeah, she, she what barely you, works anymore. What are you doing in this? It's a sloppy dog movie. Gosh, stop it. Horrible. That's telling him, Wade. Horrible. Uh, speaking of horrible, Wade, we have... Um would you like to know what we have, Wade? Yeah, let's get the horrible stuff out of the way. We've got, we got some good stuff right here. We have Good People. Now, Good People stars uh, James Franco and Kate Hudson, as, long, uh, as well as uh, Tom Wilkinson. This is the story of, a, an, of an American couple, played by Franco and uh, Hudson, and they are trying to renovate their London home when they realize that their dead downstairs neighbor has $400,000 worth of cash to be, oh, let's say, stolen by these horrible American good people. So um, it's an interesting, provocative premise, I guess. The thing is that uh, it, it gets really preposterous because you start, you, know, you start looping in the guns and the running around, and it's just, 
it's just, it, you know, what should have been like an interesting like moral quandary kind of movie really is just, it just becomes a typical crime caper that's totally predictable and uh, I just think it's not worth the people who are in it. So I would pass on good people. Okay. Uh, we also have, um, based on the Elmore Leonard novel, uh, we have, uh, well, this is based on the Elmore Leonard novel, The Switch, and it became Life of Crime, which has a good cast, Jennifer Aniston, uh, Isla Fisher, uh, Will Forte, and um, Tim Robbins and uh, John Hawks. Um, is it good? It's not bad. It's a, it's a bit of a diversion. You know, there's much better Elmore Leonard adaptations out there. Uh, there's a lot of, slapstick, lot, lot of slapstick violence in it. Um, it doesn't necessarily have the snap of other Elmore Leonard adaptations, like, you know, Get Shorty. Um, but still, if you like Elmore Leonard and you like this cast, uh, I would definitely at least give it a rental. You know, Jennifer Aniston, she's got so much money, it, it constantly annoys me that she does not help get good movies made. Yeah. I don't know why she does the little movies that she... I don't know how she picks them. I don't either. Um, but, look, there's better Elmore Leonard out there, but now that Elmore Leonard, of course, uh, has left us, um, you know... If it's not going to be Jackie Brown and it's not going to be Get Shorty, I guess it's going to have to be Life of Crime. Oh, my goodness. There you go. All right. Uh, so I got three here. If you're thinking, I want to see a good, you know, movie about it. Good, you know, not a romance, but just like a, like a two-hander, right? A good, uh, you know, male-female. Like all three of these, they've got, a, got, got couples on the covers, right? It's, it's, it's a guy and a girl, and what's the deal? All right. One, two of them are fantastic. One of them is dreadful. The one that's dreadful... I'm so sorry, Cameron Diaz and Jason Siegel. I do like you both, but what were you thinking? What what were they... Th- Seriously, sex tape? Are you kidding me? Terrible. This is like the worst movie of 1994. This is, this is like they a... They didn't have the iPad in 1994. Oh, my like. gosh. I know, but the concept. It's like it feels like a 1994 comedy. Everybody knows this thing. We all saw the trailers, right? They're a couple. They, he, he accidentally uploads their, their videotaped sex to the cloud. And then it's... Uh, In order getting to, to, to get oh to that point... Oh, my gosh. It's it's, just, there's such gymnastics to get to the point where they upload to the cloud and then their friends can have it. But, like, all this stuff. But, then, but, the, but all this is about is the antics of somehow trying to get ahead of the... Which is also complete... Even if you got to that place, by then it proliferates so virally... The, the, all these stupid antics are, are just moot. It just, it, all this is is just, it's somebody came up with a crazy idea and then tried to sort of one-up the idea with the crazy ideas that they would use to undo the crazy idea. It's horrible. It's dreadful. And, they, and to watch them just push this snowball uphill uh, to, to, to somehow try to make this thing work is just tragic. And the worst part of it is Jake Kasdan. Jake Kasdan, you're a decent director. You're a Kasdan that's like that's like if you're. I mean, that's almost as if your name is Da Vinci. Why why are you doing this? Do do real movies, man. Your dad just gotten back in the Star Wars yeah. saddle. What are you doing? You're shaming the family. Stop it. Well, he, a, it it's like Jason Reitman. Oh, I mean, Jason well, but, Reitman and Jake Kaz, an interesting. Uh, but see, Jason parallels. Reitman, I really, that new film, Men, Women, and Children. I really, I think oh, it's liked great. It? I liked it a lot. Interesting. Did you not like it? Um, you know what it. it, it my only issue is that it's going to be dated in like six months. Doesn't matter. If you're a parent, I, I, we, Layla and I talked about this on Film Week. It's a completely different film to people who have kids. I, I assure you, it's I completely nothing. different. It race. just chills us. I have nothing. Uh, the last two, uh, Begin Again, which uh, did not do as well, as, and not even close to as well as they, as they were hoping, because Weinstein Company made a marketing decision to change this film's title after they acquired it. And this was a huge festival hit. It originally was titled, Can a, Chong, Can a Song Save Your Life? Correct. And that was a great title. That was an incredible title. Why? For this very simple reason. Can a song change your life? Or can a song save your life? Sorry, can a song save your life? Because the obvious answer to it is, well, yes. Everyone's, well, they would, there wouldn't be a movie otherwise. But then you're going to be like, but why? And whose song? And what song? And, and you start, I mean, it, it conjures up a lot of questions. It's one of those great titles that's not like any other title, and it's fantastic, and it's provocative, and the marketing would have been amazing with that title. Instead, they went the easy route because you have a bunch of people in the marketing department that say, oh, it's too long, and this is too wordy, and people don't know what it is, and it doesn't fit the template that I've been working with for the last 900 years. So uh, we need to give it something really generic that can be easily sold, and, and we can do a little cookie-cutter marketing campaign and move on. So we're going to rename it Begin Again. <laughs> Are you kidding me? Great. Horrible. 
Angry dreadful. Wade. John Carney wrote and directed this, and he deserves better, and I hope that this thing gets some real awards uh, season attention, because it's a better film than that. Uh, John Carney, of course, did uh, Once, which, I Once adore. which is fantastic, yep. and became a big hit on Broadway as well, as in a musical version. And uh, this is a more big-budget film. This is not as low-budget and kind of by the seat of your pants as Once was, but Kira Knightley, Mark Ruffalo, fantastic. Great supporting performances by Adam Levine, Catherine Keener, CeeLo Green, you know, who's now gotten himself in a little bit of legal trouble. Uh, Haley Steinfeld, who just keeps impressing the hell out of me. Um, and it, it, this is just a wonderful, wonderful movie uh, about, you know, art- artistry and being a songwriter and, and how persisting with your dreams can change yourself and people and the people you come into contact with. And uh, it, it's, it really is, it, it's, it's not once, but it's maybe a hair below once, you know? It's in the same ballpark, it's in the same league, and I, it's just absolutely delightful. And these actors have, have almost never been better. And uh, kind of similarly, I love The Fault in Our Stars. I realize I'm not a millennial, I'm not 20 years old, uh, I'm not, I, I haven't read the book, I'm not supposed to like this movie, but I don't care. This is the, uh, the Little Infinities Extended Edition on Blu-ray and DVD. includes the extended and theatrical versions. I don't really care about the extended version. It doesn't make much of a difference to me. It's a wonderful movie. Um, yeah, I get it. It's movie cancer, right? That's, this is about a couple of, a couple of kids, uh, played by Shailene Woodley and uh, Ansel uh, uh, Elcourt, who, uh, you know, they were together in uh, the other thing. Uh, Divergent. Divergent, thank you. They were also together in Divergent. And he's like... He's, he's a little mannered as an actor. I, I've seen him in several films now, and he kind of starts, he does a lot of the same things, you know, licking his lips. And there, there's, if, if I were directing him, I'd love to just pull him aside and go, mm, here's a list of five things I wish you would stop doing. If you catch yourself doing these things, please stop doing them. You know, they're, they're interfering with the authenticity of your performance. But that being said, he is still really good. Yes, there are a couple of kids, you know, they're, they, they meet, they're, they're, you know, she's dying from cancer, he's in recovery from cancer, and uh, they become kind of, you know, wounded soulmates, and it's about this wonderful romantic journey that they take, and it is a deeply touching film, and yes, you know what, shoot me, I'm sorry, I'm a sap, I cried like a baby at the end, but it's a really good you, movie. You, you really are like a sap, it's you, a, you, you cry movies all the time. It's a really good movie, well, and it's, it's just, good. she is so wonderful, there is just not a better a- young actress at all, there's no one more authentic these days, except for maybe Emma Stone, but Shailene Woodley is just wonderful. Uh, Wade's gay. Anyway. Good extras, by the way, too, really good extras, but pristine Blu-ray, fantastic. Uh, Garden State was one film, I wish, uh, wish I Was Here, another film. You know, it, you know what? I mean, this is this is this almost is the, more famous Zach, for the Kickstarter deal. Yeah, I know. This was uh, directed by um, uh, Zach Braff, uh, who also uh, you know co-wrote it and produced it. And I got to say that as, as as you know, Garden State I liked a lot. It was a little calculated, but I did like it a lot. This one just seems like it seems like a bit of a vanity project. He shoots himself in close up a lot and really annoyed the hell out of me. Anyway, uh, Zach Braff plays a, a guy. He's got uh, two kids. And he wants to be an actor. He finds out that his father uh, is, uh, has a serious illness that I will not give away. And so uh, it disrupts his life, and he wants to homeschool his kids. And he learns all about himself, all sorts of wonderful, terrific lessons about life that he learns about himself while taking care of his dad, homeschooling his kids. It's got a good cast. Um, Ashley Green's in it. Kate Hudson's in it. Manny Patinkin's in it as the father. Um, you know, I, I just think that this thing is just, it's got that kind of mawkish, you know, new agey spiritual crap that I really like, and lots of really like cliche follow your dreams type, you know, the homilies. And I just, it's very broad, and I just really did not dig it at all. Um, I wanted to like it, you know, but yeah. uh, I would go, I would much prefer uh, uh, Garden State. So we have that, and uh, we also have Wade, one of my favorite films of the year, Snowpiercer from uh, Bong Joon Ho. I was in, good. I was an early. Uh, it's good. I was an early champion of this film, and yep. I absolutely love it. I thought it was absolutely visionary stuff. Bong is absolutely he's the guy is uh, guy's a visionary. But I'll tell you, it's not for everybody. It is like, not like for if everybody. you go to this thinking, oh, cool, this is going to be like Wars. a st- yeah, no, <laughs> it sure as hell isn't. It, no, it's not. It's, this it's, thing. Th- th- this thing tells its story, has a certain rhythm and pace. That is not very American. No, in its, it's not. You know what I mean? I think, a, I think a lot of people were caught off guard. I really do. Because I know a lot of people that went and saw this. Like when you first raved about it to a lot of people, they're like, oh, oh cool, that sounds like a, like, it, like a thinking person's tent pole. It, not even. It's a tent. I mean, it's a, it's a science fiction big budget thing, but. Yeah, it, it, but it's, it's, still, it's, a, uh, it's still a Korean film. It's still very much a Korean film. 
even though it's got you know the English English language and it's got Tilda Swinton and uh, yeah, so Tilda what, Swinton is great. She's phenomenally weird. Uh, she is. She is so. Uh, this thing is. You know what? It's also. It's very violent. And as and as they go, make their way towards the front yes. of the train. Every single car is like another pr- production design visual it, feast. It, it really is. It's really fantastic. And uh, I'm not saying we haven't seen the story before about the poor people who live in the back of the train and the rich people who live in the front of the train. I mean, the Titanic did the same thing. Well, a lot and, of films have done the same and thing. Oblivion was sort of uh, based on that whole kind of thing too. Yes, but. I I thought this thing was absolutely just riveting. I loved it. I loved it from from beginning to end. Chris Evans, who is a bit of a charisma hole to me. I, I don't really find him all that interesting as an actor. I mean, you know, he doesn't destroy the movie. He's got a lot more apparently, going on than he doesn't kill it. His directing debut apparently is sharp as hell. I've heard that. Yeah. It was making the, it was making the festival rounds. Yeah, got picked up. Um, now, since I assume you're not going to give this to me, that's okay. <laughs> uh, anyway, I could not recommend highly enough Snowpiercer, one of the best films I've seen this year. And the last two are not the best films I've seen this year. Uh, Mr. Peabody and Sherman. Why? Just why? Seriously, why? Uh, you know, when it was part of the Rock and Bullwinkle show, it was fine. It was a short. It was a thing. They'd go back in time. They, you know, learn a little thing here and there. And then suddenly, somebody got the thought of, let's get the uh, How to Train Your Dragon guys and have them animate a whole feature-length Peabody and Sherman because there's so much there. And there isn't. It. Uh, I mean, it's not offensively bad, but it's just like, oh my gosh, there's CGI animated now, and they've got this convoluted plot, and it's, you know, uh, you're you're it, 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 you you're trying to do kind of a Back to the Future deal, but it, it, I don't know. It just, it it really doesn't work. It's it's well intentioned. I'm sure there are kids that'll enjoy it, but man, it's that's a that's a tough one. That's a Blu-ray and DVD and uh, uh, a digital HD combo set. And then we also have uh, another Blu-ray, DVD, digital combo set, The Purge Anarchy. Um, the, uh, the whole Purge thing kind of escapes me. Again, I'm probably too old. But, um, you know, this, is, this, this all kind of feels like uh, uh, Return of the Archons, right? <laughs> yes, it does. Star, right? Star Trek episode. Festival! Festival! Oh, God. The worst. Uh, are you are you of the body, Landrew? <laughs> the world, oh, Landrew. <laughs> you know, it's like everything comes back to a Star Trek episode, doesn't it? Yeah, and you know what? You you realize how many of those episodes sucked. Yeah. Well, anyway, I'm sorry, you really do. Every uh, I always enjoyed that one. Every every year uh, in this you know dystopian scenario, every year there are uh, twelve years of anarchy where everything is legal, like anything and everything that you want to do. Why somebody doesn't just blow up an atomic bomb and end it all that first year, I don't know. But anyway, uh, so you know this is more of that mayhem, and and it's you know. Yeah, it's not a horror film, but it's horrific. It's a horrific action film, so whatever. Uh, Wade, real quick, we have Life After Beth. This is a, uh, a zombie comedy with Aubrey Plaza and uh, John C. Riley and Molly Shannon. It's about a girl who becomes a zombie, and uh, yet she still winds up um, the girlfriend to, a, uh, to this guy, uh, played by Dane DeHaan, who, of course, is uh, the newest, hottest thing, especially after uh, Spider-Man 2. Um, you know, this movie gave it a shot. I, I, I'm, I'm going to say something. I, I'm not a big fan of this movie. But I would like to recommend one of the first zombie comedies that had it come out, or the first modern zombie comedy since the zombie renaissance, where had it come out now, you'd be loving it. But it came out in 2007. It's called Fido. And Fido is really clever. And Fido is about zombies, but essentially... Uh, zombies have been domesticated so that they, you know, they, you walk them on a leash and they live their life with their owners and every, the world's like the 1950s and all the zombies walk around on a leash being owned by owners like pets, like dogs, and that's just how the world is. And it's a very sly satire on America in the 50s and it's got a lot of funny stuff in it. So what I'm saying is Life After Beth, meh, but 2007's Fido... I would go ahead and seek that one out if you really want a zombie comedy. No, that's interesting. Fido. I, I, zombie comedies I, I like better than zombie movies these days. I'm going to do some uh, four, three foreign films here real quickly, and then we'll uh, wrap the show out with a little bit of uh, classic stuff. Um, we've got first off Chinese Puzzle, which is wonderful. And I have a, a personal... I'm going, to, I'm going to do a little name drop from Cocoa, Mark. I'm warning you. Wait, hang on. What's that noise? Uh-huh. Oh, yeah. There it is. Right. Uh, so anyway, the um, uh, if, did you ever see uh, L'Auberge Espagnole by chance? I did not. Did you ever see uh, Russian Dolls? Uh, I did not. 
Okay, well then you have absolutely no connection to this film. <laughs> I I'm, really I'm, don't. I'm sorry about that. Uh, Cédric Clapiche, the amazing French director, uh, wonderful with comedy, with drama, the whole thing. Uh, you know, L'Auberge Espagnole was a film that he made, you know, uh, a decade ago, and uh, was sort of the film that broke Roman Duris into the mainstream. It's about a guy, you know, an exchange student. He's in Spain, and they all live in this kind of one little hostel, uh, like apartment, and how these characters interact and so forth. And you know, it's 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 like your college experience in Europe, uh, ex- with st- you know all these students from different countries is studying in Spain, and it was wonderful, and it really caught on, and and it was just a fantastic film. It was one of the first films shot digitally, right? You know, he went and got a cheap digital camera. He'd written the thing in a couple of weeks. He followed it up a few years later with uh, Russian Dolls, which follows the same characters some years later, you know, and how their relationships are changing and who's reconnecting with whom and so forth. And uh, I don't want to give away any of the character details in case you need to catch up on the whole thing, Um, but this is the one that really ties it all up. And he waited practically another, like, you know, eight, nine years before he made this one because he wanted their lives to really be different. They're married, they have kids, and so forth and so on. And it takes place now in New York. Romain Duris, Audrey Tautou, Cécile de France, and Kelly Riley, wonderful Kelly Riley, who's been in the whole thing, who's been in all the way from the beginning, just like Audrey Tautou. And uh, it's fantastic. It's just, I, I can't even tell you how magical this entire Odyssey winds up being. If you love these characters in L'Auberge Espagnol, and you, you really got gripped by their life trajectory in Russian Dolls, and you thought that Clapiche had given up on the whole thing, he just lowers the boom and hits you with this wonderful, uh, philosophical, life-changing uh, culmination to the trilogy here. It's fantastic. Will there be a fourth film? I don't know. Maybe. I interviewed Clapiche. I did a, a Q&A with him after the screening of this film. Or after, actually, it was after, before the screening of this, after L'Auberge Espagnol, uh, the you know, kind of classic screening at uh, Colcoa this year. And um, he loves these characters. And the most interesting thing that came out of that, believe it or not, was an audience question. It wasn't even one of my questions. Because this film was shot on film with a bigger budget, unlike uh, L'Auberge Espagnol, which was shot digitally. And they asked him, well, digital now is like so ubiquitous and it's so inexpensive. Why did you sh- go back to film? And he said because it was cheaper. It was cheaper to shoot in New York with film than on digital. Was it cheaper to shoot or post? Cheaper to shoot. To shoot. Not because, to for two big reasons, they're shooting in apartments in New York, in closed spaces. Digital requires you to bring so much equipment with you that it becomes impractical to shoot quickly. You would have had to have a lengthier schedule. Digital would have required a lengthier schedule and more people. It's just it's it's too cumbersome to shoot with all that gear. Whereas with with the you know a regular just a camera, it's freaking handheld thing. You just move, you run and gun, and you can you in these tight spaces. It's still a more economical way to shoot with a crew. The other thing, the light in New York is very very hard. The whites are very white. The blacks are very black. It's just the nature of the way the sunlight hits Manhattan, and digital doesn't capture that very well without an awful lot of additional lighting. As Gordon Willis will tell you, you don't need an awful lot of light to capture New York really well on film. Therefore, film, for reasons of light and for reasons of gear, became more economical to shoot with film in Chinese Puzzle. How great is that? Beautiful Blu-ray from Cohen Media Group. Uh, I, of course, uh, a full disclosure, am often uh, employed by Cohen to do uh, audio commentaries, but I love their stuff anyway, and I'm so proud to be a part of such a great company. Last two uh, foreign language things here. From Criterion, we have the original The Vanishing and uh, Federico Fellini's La Dolce Vita. And uh, it's just, both of these are fantastic. The Vanishing, of course, was uh, remade. And uh, I'm going to talk about that in just a moment because that's out this week as well. The remake of The Vanishing is also out on Blu-ray. But this Criterion Blu-ray of the original George Sluzer Vanishing uh, from 1988 is great. It is one of the great foreign thrillers of all time. Don't miss it. There's almost no extras on this. There's a couple of interviews, uh, one with uh, uh, actor Joanna, uh, uh, Joanna Terstega and one with uh, George Sluzer himself, and then the trailer. And then there's also an essay that our good friend Scott Foundas wrote, which is really good. Scott's a great writer. Uh, I hate him for that. But uh, it's it's sharp. Great Blu-ray. I just wish there were more extras. And then, of course, La Dolce Vita. It goes without saying. One of the most uh, influential foreign language films of all time. The uh, amazing three-hour masterpiece 
from Federico Fellini from 1960. Uh, it's just brilliant. And there, there are a few films as brilliant as La Dolce Vita. It makes its Blu-ray debut, and it is a time for celebration. Gobs of extras, all of them worth watching. The movie is three hours. The extras will probably take you another three hours to get through. So set a day aside. Do yourself a favor. Call in sick and watch everything on the Blu-ray from Criterion La Dolce Vita. Uh, Wade, as we come in for landing on this week's show, we have uh, Fedora. Now, the thing with Billy Wilder is that, although he's one of my all-time favorite directors, uh, you have to remember that he had a very, very long career, longer than we tend to think. He made films well into the 70s, as he was getting much older, and Fedora is one of his last films, and the great thing about it is that it reunited him with some of his best collaborators from the 50s, uh, William Holden, who, of course, starred in uh, Stalag 17, um, his longtime screenwriter, uh, I.A.L. Diamond, they wrote Some Like It Hot, and the composer, uh, Miklos Rosa, he scored Double Indemnity. So you get all these people who had, they had worked together in decades past coming back in the late 70s for Fedora. That's the good news. The bad news, the movie's not that great. I know. It's sad, <laughs> isn't it? I know. I just, Wilder was just, it's not, you know what, it, the, the whole thing is about the surprise ending at the end, which you'll be able to figure yeah. out pretty easily yeah so the whole movie just really exists it's it's a, it, it's not like the sixth sense but it's in, in that sense that the movie exists for the surprise ending I, I will admit that it has a lot of style to it you know yeah um but ultimately i just feel like wilder is kind of just giving himself some work you know his best days were behind him uh movie's not that interesting you know it's very old-fashioned i just think that uh if you're just discovering billy wilder um, you, there are way many other places to start, better places to start than, uh, than Fedora. Um, so I would pass on that. No uh, extras on this thing, although it, it is massive from a 2K. Uh, negative, so I guess that's something, but ultimately I'd pass on Fedora. And from the good people at Twilight Time... I bumped the mic. I know you did. I haven't done that in a while. You've been, you've been more coordinated. From Twilight Time, uh, I love going to ScreenArchives.com, ScreenArchives.com, which is now affiliated uh, with uh, FilmScore Monthly, and of course they, they're the exclusive distributor for Twilight Time titles. Uh, Twilight Time has licensed some awesome, awesome titles for Blu-ray, and they've done a great job with them, as they always do. From the Fox Library, Under Fire, which uh, the Roger Spottiswood film from 1983 is still really good, believe it or not. It almost feels more timely than it ever has in this, this story of photojournalists and, uh, you know, and caught up in uh, the Nicaraguan Revolution in 1979. Um, it, it, it just it feels like this could be in the Middle East or anywhere else. It's a really good film, and it's a very good Blu-ray, and uh, Nick Nolte has never been better, but I'll tell you, it's, uh, it, it's just the supporting cast that really kills it. Jean-Louis Trintignant is fantastic. Gene Hackman is fantastic. Um, really, really good. Ed Harris... Not bad, a little bit that he has. Uh, Also on Blu-ray from the MGM library, Audrey Rose. Uh, One of the last really decent films that Robert Wise did, uh, even though I still like Star Trek Motion Picture in ways that Mark does not. This is from 1977. Robert Wise really kind of proved that he could uh, hop to a different genre here, and he jumped into this kind of creepy, uh, thrillery, horror-y story with both feet and did a great job. And we forget, he did The Haunting, right? You know? It's like he makes an interesting transition in his career from early in his career all the way to the end of his career and shows that he can really kind of, uh, kind of canvas everything. So Audrey Rose, uh, creepy, creepy cult film. Very, very good. Uh, the Blob. This is um, an interesting release because... This is the uh, let's let's put it this way. If you really really want to see the great the Blob, it's the original film that was that is now from Criterion. The original Blob is the best. The 1988 thing from Chuck Russell, who is a better director than this, which was co-written by Chuck Russell and Frank Darabont, is really not that great. But this is out on Blu-ray. For those who like it, uh, it's kind of unfortunate it's not better given who's involved in it. Because Chuck Russell, right? I mean, you know... Uh, the, he did stuff. He's, he's done big blockbustery stuff. I don't know sure. what he's doing now. You know, Frank Darabont, for crying out loud. You know, The Walking Dead and That's uh, right. this Shawshank and everything. I mean, it's like, why, why wouldn't they be able to do something better? I don't know. And then, of course, The Vanishing, the remake, another remake uh, of a film that was better the first time around. Uh, when Sluzer remade The Vanishing in uh, 1993, you could tell it was like, really, you're going to pay me to make a movie I've already done and have Jeff Bridges in it and Kiefer Sutherland? Okay, I'll do that. Uh, but it's not going to be as good. And it's not. 
but it's fine. Uh, it, it doesn't completely bonk it. Sandra Bullock, you know, is, is in it as well and obviously still, you know, kind of trying to get her, her ultra mega star status going. But uh, again, you know, sticking stars in something that's already worked once with a little bit less energy doesn't necessarily substitute for the energy. And then the final uh, Twilight Time title on Blu-ray from the 20th Century Fox Library is The Believers with Martin Sheen, which is, uh, you know, a better film because of Martin Sheen. John Schlesinger has he was just kind of going through the motions with this one. Uh, this is, you know, a 1987 kind of horror-y film-ish uh, all about, you know, uh, voodoo and the occult and Martin Sheen and how he gets caught up in it. And it's, it's really not that scary. It's kind of more gross. The only thing that I remember about this that uh, from when I saw it when I was younger that really kind of haunted me all these years is when the little the skin cracks open and all the spiders come out. I've had nightmares about that for like 20 years. It's horrific. Well, you also cried at The Fault in Our Stars. I did because it's so good. And uh, real quickly, right at the very, very end of the show, just to make mention of these, there's no reason to uh, necessarily review these other than to say that uh, uh, Kino continues to give us really good quality Blu-rays out of the, um, the uh, Kino uh, Lorber Classics line. Uh, these are all classic films, primarily from 20th Century Fox and MGM, uh, that they are sub-licensing, much like Twilight Time, and they're doing a fantastic job with them. Uh, previously, it's been mostly UA straight stuff, this is, uh, they're now digging a little deeper into that library and giving us some really great stuff. Desperately Seeking Susan, now on Blu-ray, still holds up. Last Embrace, now on Blu-ray. Jonathan Demi Thriller with Roy Scheider and Janet Margolin, uh, which from, like, right when Demi's, Demi's making that transition from exploitation films to, like, real movies. Fantastic, very Hitchcockian. Uh, True Confessions. You know, not as great as it should be. Robert De Niro and Robert Duvall, uh, you know, the, the trying to kind of bring a little Godfather uh, luster with them. Uh, not really, not bad. Pretty good. Uh, sh- again, should be better. Wonderful cinematography by Owen Roisman. Great score by George De La Rue. And a fantastic sporting performance by uh, Burgess Meredith with a, a pretty fantastic sporting performance by Charles Durning. Uh, Mulholland Falls, terrible film. Uh, this is the one that's kind of not that really not that great here. Uh, Lee Tamahori bonked it on this. He was trying to make a big transition from Once for Warriors and become a Hollywood director. Didn't really work. Uh, Married to the Mob, another Jonathan Demi classic, uh, which is it annoys me with the cinematography, but uh, Michelle Pfeiffer is wonderful, Matthew Modine is wonderful, and uh, I'm, I'm I'm glad this is finally out on Blu-ray. It deserves to be. Uh, digging back, or, uh, digging even deeper back into the uh, the library of classics, Billion Dollar Brain with Michael Caine. Uh, he, you know, once again he plays Harry Palmer. This is you know one of his uh, one of his Harry Palmer trilogy films, and uh, it's he, he's great. He's great. Uh, you know, I'd, I'd love to see all of the Harry Palmer films all kind of uh, stacked into a box set. But uh, they, they, they had that in the UK. In the UK, they have the Harry Palmer collection. I would love for them to have it here. I, I wish they would. But that being said, since we don't have all of them, I'll settle for Billion Dollar Brain for now on, on a, a lovely Blu-ray. Uh, Top Copy by Jules Dassin with a fantastic performance this by good, Peter Ustinov. You know, they, they, well, here's the thing. This, uh, to be honest, this, I, I do like this movie. This movie, I love this film. It's it's a bit like uh, Rafifi in that there's a very extended heist. It, it's well, it's and it's Jules Dassin again. You and know, Rafifi. Dassin, yeah, sure. that's why. So I mean, you feel like oh, he's doing that, but in color with a more oh, modern fantastic. cast. But it is good. 1964, a really good film, beautiful color cinematography uh, that just glows in this Blu-ray. So it's a wonderful, wonderful job. And then lastly, a little bit of an oddity uh, before I lose my voice for the next two weeks. Roger Moore in The Naked Face. Roger Moore, an actor that the British can't stand, but Americans seem to love for some reason. Uh, Brian Forbes, who did a lot of these kind of political thrillers at the time, in 1984, just kind of winding up his career, and Roger Moore had pretty much wound up his, uh, his James Bond efforts, they made uh, The Naked Face. And um, it's, uh, it, it, you know, it's, it's, it's okay. It's a, it's a graceful way for Roger Moore to kind of go out playing this, uh, this doctor who gets caught in this kind of Hitchcockian, uh, you know, murder conspiracy. Not bad. Um, based on a novel by Sidney Sheldon, who, for my money, is always really going to be the guy who created I Dream of Jeannie. But, you know, shy of that, uh, it's, it's not bad. It was, uh, this is one of those lost canon films, by the way, from the canon library that just yeah. faded away. It never really got a proper release, so it's been resurrected here. Uh, now that it fell into the MGM library and Kino Lorber picked it up, and it's a good-looking Blu-ray. We are done. We will not be here next week, but we will be back the week after. See you then. <laughs>